Hi, it's Rob Moore here. Welcome to The Disruptive Entrepreneur. I'm very grateful and thankful to have Tony Buzan. And we're in his house, which of course, if you're listening to the audio, you wouldn't be able to see. But this house has a lot of character. And Tony has specifically asked, and I completely agree, let's have no scripts. I don't like scripts. You don't like scripts. So why don't we just jump in? I am very amazed that you've been able to write 150 books. That blows my mind. Um, <laughs> I've written eight or eight stroke nine. Why it's eight stroke nine is the nine one is about to come out. And I've only ever met two people who've written more and you've written 141 books more. So <laughs> I find that hugely impressive. Uh, so maybe you could just talk how, why? I mean, did you one day say, I'm gonna write lots of books or is it just your life's work? translated into books. How and why have you written so many books? Uh, well, it'll take me uh, 140 hours to answer okay. that question. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I basically started to write when I was eight years old because I loved my pets. Yeah. And I wrote a little book, you know, My Pets. Right. Um, and I hadn't written another book s- until 1971. Okay. Uh, and by that time, I had begun to invent the mind map. And when I was trying to write in a normal way, in school, at university, in business, you know, business reports, mm. essays, it was difficult. Mm. And I got stuck on the first sentence. I didn't like doing it. When I started, it was kind of boring, uh, writer's block, all the traditional stuff. Uh, when I invented mind maps, I began to realize that the way in which I've been taught to think was the way of not thinking. And I was training myself to become more and more stupid, right? (laughs) to become less creative. Mm. And I therefore began to realize that the mind map was a map of the territory of my mind. Now, if I were exploring somewhere, if it was an army, if it was a business, one always has a, you know, like a front guard who go and check the territory. Normally we don't, Mm. but with a mind map, you can. And I could. So I could map out the territory that I was going to explore. And it just made writing so much more easy I mean, I could easily say 10 times more easy, but it's probably 100 times more easy. Right. So how did I write 141 books more than you? <laughs> <laughs> and <coughs> I'm sure you know how you can catch up with me. <laughs> uh, if I'm al- alive for another 60 years, <laughs> yeah. And so can all you as well. Mm. Uh, I had a thought for a book. I then mind mapped it out. I then looked at it integrated into my mind, got the map in my head, and then I wanted to explore it. Mm -hmm. And on the mind map, for example, there were 10 branches. Each branch became a chapter. Mm -hmm. It was all there. Our brains Mm self-organize when we know how to nurture the self-development. And each chapter became another mind map. So I had 10 mind maps and the mind map, and occasionally in one of the branch mind maps, that got so exciting, I added another child branch, and that was another mind map. And so for a book, 10 to 15 mind maps, and that was it. Mm. And with all the territory, I could then get the book out. Mm. And it's fun, it's Mm. enjoyable. There is no mental block, the only, problem (laughs) is too many books coming. (laughs) Yeah. It's funny you say that because the first book that you wrote that I read was in 2006 and it was on memory. And uh, it was actually you who got me into mind mapping. And whilst... Thank you for that. So thank you. (laughs) And I didn't know at the time... I'm I'm actually speaking to uh, my graduate. Yes, you are. You're a a graduate. (laughs) And uh, the last three books I wrote, exactly the process you explained is what I did. An idea, um, branches off the main concept, and then branches off those, 
and trying to write something, a book, a document, a dissertation or whatever, your brain doesn't know necessarily where to start or finish and just trying to sort of get it out of yourself, it can be very unorganised and chaotic. And, and for me, it really helped A, with the planning, it helped B, with clarity, uh, it, it helped the organisation, you know, of the, the chapters, if you like. And then once that's done, like you just said, blah, 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 I just felt like the book came out of me. Um, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> is, is thank you one. for writing them. And I had no idea that you'd invented the mind map. So can you tell us a bit about the process of that? You know, how okay. you stumbled upon it, discovered it, and then uh, brought it to the masses? I did not like homework. I did not like taking notes. I didn't like using one color all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I did not enjoy academic in-school learning. And I began to realize that color could help me. But when I was in school, don't use color, Buzan. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> I then met an artist, Lorraine K. Gill, and she had explained to me how you can draw. I said, I can't draw. And she said, you're human. The brain is designed to be able to draw. Mm. It's natural. And Lorraine Gill taught me how to do that. And she saw the growing idea of the mind map and had strongly reinforced the idea that there should be colors and images in notes. And that helped me begin to, if you like, give birth yeah. to the mind map. And is that because people don't think in written words, so this is more like how people think? Is that the case? That is the case. Yeah. You know, our brains think in the same way. Yeah. And therefore, when we're thinking, we're thinking in images, our multi-sensories, we're making connections mm. and associations. And so the mind map is the expression of the right. human language. Yeah. And it took me a long time, you know, from the age of, say, six until I was 40, well, no, 30. Yeah. Um, when it was there, you know, it, it existed. Mm -hmm. I'd experimented with colors. I'd studied the great geniuses <coughs> and discovered that nearly all of those did messy notes. Yeah. Leonardo, Darwin, Madame Curie, I mean, you name it, messy notes, mm. all of them. So how could geniuses be doing messy notes? And it began to dawn on me that if that's what they are doing, um, those who are scientists, those who are biologists, those who are military leaders, those who are business people, those who are academics, all the great geniuses using different languages from different cultures, all coming up with the same thing, mm. I thought, well, maybe, mm. maybe doing messy notes is the best way to do it and they're not messy at all. Mm. They've got images, they've got doodles, sure. they've got connecting lines. Mm. And so the mind map, <coughs> the mind map arrived in 1960 to 71 in its final form. Right. Is it fair to say as well that whatever essence you experience <coughs> the world and then you see in your mind and then into a word on a paper, there's maybe, excuse me, <coughs> a few processes in that, and those processes can be blocks. You know, trying to express how you feel or see in your mind in a specific word, there can be a, a lag between that. And I've seen people who mind map a lot, and they're so free. It's just like, you know, they can, <laughs> the, the, the speed at which, you know, for example, I'm a big, I love going to seminars, I love learning. Yes. And, um, I try and listen or read to around about 500 books a year and I love learning. And um, when I'm writing in note form, I'm always behind. You know, the information comes in, <laughs> da, 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 the mess in your brain, words. But you see people mind mapping and it's just, 
I don't know, it's like a, a martial artist who's been doing it 50 years. Just That wasn't a very good impression, but you know what I mean. That was a very good impression <laughs> because I studied martial arts right. <laughs> for a number of years Ooh. and uh, got a blank belt right. in Aikido, okay. you know, the way of harmony. Mm. And that is how the brain and the body work. Yeah. And w what you've said is, if you like, a tragedy. Mm. When one sees people with these phenomenal things called a human brain, yeah. and they think, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. uh, can you, uh, I can't do it, uh, I've got a block, no, I'll never do it. And they should have been exactly what you were showing. Hey, you know, here I am. Bum, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, of course, of course. Brrr, which is natural. Mm. That's the way we are designed. Yeah. And what the unfortunately too common series of procedures is to make people linear using sentences, yeah. using lines, doing it line after line after line, not going random, not exploring, must sit, must be quiet, must be still. Mm. When in fact, you know, this is an atomic piece of equipment. Mm. And it's designed to move. Yeah. And when it's still, it's really still. It's not exhausted. It's, ah. And then, mm. again. Mm. So what you're saying about people is a tragedy. Mm. Because just imagine the planet if everybody had the same feelings as you, i.e., well, I've written nine books and I'm going to do another 900 <coughs> and it's all flowing and it's exciting and I love it and I can't wait to learn. I am frustrated if I've ever stopped from learning. I love learning. That's what everybody should be like. Mm. And when you are like that <coughs> and you realize how marvelous the brain is, what do you want to do with your brain? What do you want to do with yours? Mm. What do you want to do with it? Good question. Yeah. I'd love to explore more what it can do. Yep. Uh, I'd certainly love to be able to share some messages and lessons that I get that maybe I solve within my own life that other people may want to solve too. And I want to do it for a very long time. Uh, and then I want to make sure that if there was anything in there that was useful, it's out in the world and left when I'm gone. So you want to help the planet? Mm. Do you have any desire to damage your own brain? No. Do you have any desire to go and pound somebody else's brain? No. So there we are. I probably <laughs> was doing that when I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. But now, so now you imagine the world with people who really know how to mind map, how to think, how to learn, there ain't going to be no more wars mm. because when you know what you got, mm. you want to protect it, you want it to be your treasure mm. and you want to give to as many people as you can, sure. whatever you can, and you want them to be as happy and productive and creative and natural mm. as you are experiencing. Sure. So my maps are not just a note-taking technique. Mm. They're a, a philosophy on one deep level. Right. Uh, they're life-saving. Mm. I have this belief that everyone can be creative, but somewhere along the line, a parent, a teacher, the world, some media has convinced them that they can't. What are your thoughts on that? You're an expert of the brain, and obviously you design mind mapping, so do you think everybody has the capacity to be free and creative of expression? Yes. What about those people <laughs> that say that I can't because I'm techie or my brain isn't wired that way? <laughs> Doing these exclamation marks around the <laughs> yeah. side of it. Yeah. The, the brain is inherently, naturally, to the core, creative. Mm. That's how it is. A creative brain can find solutions to problems. If it can't find solutions, it dies. And therefore, anyone who's alive 
is creative anyway. Yeah. And watch these babies. And people say, you know, well, that, that baby, you know, from a bad family won't be, won't be academic, won't be successful. Rubbish. Mm. Of course it will, when it is guided in the right way. Um, I mean, to, <coughs> to fine tune your question there in terms of why are so many people not creative when they are? In other words, why are they not expressing their creativity when they truly are creative? Because they have been taught how to be not creative, like I was. Mm. You know, I became increasingly non-creative, and I thought I was not creative. I thought I could not draw. I thought I would never be an artist. And it was uh, the artist, Lorraine Gill, who just switched me around, shifted my tectonic plates in my brain, and I could now draw, I could be a painter, I could be much more creative. And that gave rise to the mind maps. Now, as you are speaking to me you know, at this moment in time, I am polemically furious about the way in which many, many children, too many, are taught how to be uncreative. Mm. And I went to check, because when I was at school, the last thing I wanted to do was to be a teacher. Because I didn't like my teachers, except one who I really did like, who was a really fabulous young man who introduced me to space, to astronomy, to exploration, to language, to poetry. Um, but I began to notice that around the world, education, on average, and it's a dangerous average, was the worst profession. Underpaid, undertrained, underprivileged, not respected, and when people were failing university entrance exams, many of them were advised, look, don't worry about it, go into education, and then you can become a teacher, then you'll get a job. And they were told 98% of them pass anyway. 98% of the failures become the teachers. People in business and you know, in the, the young businesses, the small businesses, 95% <coughs> of those, when they start at the beginning of January, are no longer there at the end of the year. 95%, boom, down. Why? Because they didn't know how to think. They had a wonderful idea, you know, a wonderful entrepreneurship passion, mm. but they didn't know what to do. And they did all the wrong things, and boom, mm. bankrupt. <coughs> but they, with their brains, knowing how to use those brains, their companies would still be alive. Mm. And so <coughs> I then explored the teaching profession. And I looked at the definitions of a teacher. Because why was it so low? Why in many countries were there no teachers in many areas? And the dictionary definition said things like, a teacher is someone who teaches something to someone. And I thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> or, and these are all in the main dictionaries. Um, a teacher is someone who teaches generally to children a subject. And that's it. Mm. And then I thought, you know, oh my God, a teacher is the most important profession on the planet. Mm. And when I went for my first job, when I did graduate, <coughs> one of the first things they offered me was selling insurance. And I said, I don't want to sell insurance. And I could have done that without getting a degree. And they said, oh, well, you can sell mutual funds. I said, what are mutual funds? <laughs> they said, sophisticated insurance. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, I don't want to sell insurance. So they said, oh, they go through the road next. They said, well, you can, yes, 
you can you can teach. I said, I do not want to be a teacher. It's the last thing I want to be. I don't want to be a teacher. So they said, da -da -da -da, farming. And I thought, farming. I love sport. I love physical activity. I love animals, managing, wonderful stuff. So I said, so what is the actual job? And then he said, um, removing manure. And I said, do you mean shoveling shit? <laughs> <laughs> so she, she said, well, you could say it's that. <laughs> and I said, um, how much does it pay? And she got furious. She said, that's the problem with you university students. You know, all you're interested in is money. And I thought, you know, the universe is telling me something. <laughs> And I thought, I'm going to take that job. Mm. And I said to her, look, I apologize, uh, but I, I will take the job regardless of the salary. Because I had thought that I had come through education to be able to help, to do exciting jobs. Um, <coughs> but I began to realize that most of my professors had been teaching me for five years to shovel shit. Mm. And they did it very well. And so I could certainly <laughs> do it very well. <laughs> and I took the job. Right. And it was a wonderful job for three months mm. in the beautiful summer, only with chickens, yeah. nobody else, nature, labor. I could think. Mm. I could think. And I began to think teaching is probably a pretty good idea right um, because I want to I want to teach the kids who were in my school who were delinquent mm. who in the 1d form the yeah. failure form but I knew they were all bright anyway mm. and so I became a teacher and so right now as I am talking to you I am finishing using my maps <laughs> my next book called The Teacher. Which you gave to me. <laughs> you kindly, um, I don't know if you've given me this one to keep. Um, that, that is the only copy, and right. that is the final so that's draft of it. That's um, like the, um, the zero one. Not even number one, that's number zero. That is not yet the book. Okay. It's got you know, a few days of yeah. fine tuning. Okay. But on June 2nd, right. it is coming out. Okay. And it's going to answer some of the points we were raising in our yeah. conversation. So if we could come back that, to that in a minute, because um, there's a couple of things I think you've maybe said that I'd love to jump into a bit. So I feel strongly that people, especially children at school, um, people who are not normal, are, are given labels and then, th then they own that label, and then maybe they become it, whether it's attention deficit or dyslexia or, you know, whatever else. Uh, and um, I personally think that's uh, really bad teaching because in my experience, everybody's an individual and normally people who have attention deficit are just bored with the thing that they are getting fed by said teacher. But then when you give them a computer game or you give them, I don't know, nature or a playground, they haven't got attention deficit anymore. So one, do you, what's your take on that? And two then therefore, is perhaps teaching as much, stopping the people we're teaching from learning bad things that suppress them, as much as teaching them things that they can express themselves in and with? Again, my response to that is yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ADDH, you know, attention deficit, hyperactive disability. <coughs> it is a label. Mm. It's a damaging, dangerous, destructive label. Mm. Uh, it produces drug addicts yeah. who are given Ritalin and other drugs that put on the brakes 
while at the same time putting on the accelerator and wipes the child <coughs> out. Right. <coughs> we are atomic, made of atoms. Mm. This is atomic. So what do you expect with this young, unbelievably brilliant, fabulously wired thing called a human being with a brain and all its extensions yeah. and trillions of cells and nerves all at work, all based on atomic energy, atomic power. Mm. That's what we are. So what would you expect this thing to be designed for? Do you think that this is designed to spend the bulk of its day here or its hand to do that or for this to be or for the eyes to be it's designed to move yeah. to sing to dance to listen to talk to communicate to be connected to the other animals, including the humans, mm. and the environment, with everything. So when children are bored by a teacher who's not taught how to teach, and is told, you know, you're, you're a failure and this and that, become a teacher, um, and just make sure you keep them in order, yeah. and then more and more procedures come in, and it becomes... So it's suppressing our creativity. Suppressing our creativity? And it becomes, on many levels, like a prison. Mm. And I have said that being forced to write in sentences all the time, those are prison sentences. Right, yeah. So, yeah, the answer is everybody is creative, mm. by definition, and all we need to do is to provide the teaching professions to make sure that every child is nurtured. Mm. You know, they've got to be watered yeah. and fed and given sunshine mm. so that they can flower. Mm. If they're put in the dark, you know, <laughs> kicked, stomped on and yeah. given no water and no food, mm. what would they do? Rebel. Yeah. And rebelling is a, a very intelligent behavior. Mm. <laughs> it's the mm. only way you can survive. Yeah. Okay, so have you got any tips on how someone can rediscover the creativity <coughs> that's inside them. How many tips would you like? <laughs> Why don't we start with one? Okay. <laughs> and, um, and maybe if it, it could be relative to people who want to start up a business or who have a business. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you, um, Rob, do you daydream? Yes. Good. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> because if you don't, you die. Mm -hmm. And in school, daydreaming is considered bad. It is necessary. So a business, you know, a business starts as a dream. It doesn't even start in garages. You know, everybody there mm. in the garage. <coughs> it starts in bed. It starts under the shower. Mm. It starts when you're walking by the river. It starts when you have an interesting thought fired in by a friend of yours and, wah, and off you go. Mm. So to be a good business individual, first of all, you've got to realize, yes, I do daydream. And number two, it's essential for survival. Mm. And number three, that's the beginning of the business. Yeah. Because then you know what you're doing. But if you've had a nice idea and you think that daydreaming is bad, which is most people do, then you go down the tubes. Yeah. So daydream. Number two, <coughs> you've got to commit. Commit. And daydreaming, survival technique, can also be, you know, on the downside of it, you can daydream and think, oh, it'd be great to have a wonderful business, you know. I want to make a trillion dollars, pounds, yen, whatever. Be wonderful. And what do you do? Continue to daydream. Yeah. All the great leaders and all the great geniuses had a daydream and they thought, ah, 
action. I've got to put it into action. I've got to work and play to make that dream come true, to make it real. <coughs> when you do that, you're on the way. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be committed. Yeah. Um, third, you've got to have faith in yourself. And it really means faith in yourself. Because if you've got that wonderful dream and you've committed to it, but you think, oh, well, you know, I'm not really that good and I, I, you know, I failed here and maybe I won't and whatever, and I'll make excuses. No excuses. When you're committed, that's your life. Mm. And you work towards it. Yep. Which then means that you naturally apply your creativity to dealing with any difficulties. When there's a difficulty, you don't think, oh, you know, you think, that's fascinating. Yep. That's a giant mountain in front of me. How am I going to get around it? Mm -hmm. Or through it? Yep. Or burying under it? Or jumping over it? Um, so you have to do that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Next, you have to know how to think. <laughs> because go into businesses and go into the you know, little boardrooms or big boardrooms. What do you think is on the tables preparing for a board meeting? What's on the table? Maybe an agenda for the meeting. Agenda. What's on the table? What's on the boardroom table? Maybe a uh, telecoms device yep. to have global conversations. Yeah. I didn't expect to get tested. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's water. Yeah. There are bowls of sweets and candies. Okay. There are pencils. There are little notepads, lined paper notepads. There are black ballpoint pens on the table. That's the boardroom mm. of the leaders, the captains of that industry, that new business. And they sit around and they make their notes with their one color pen or their pencil in their pad and talk and eat the sweets. Do you think that that's going to produce a really good company of great thinkers? Because there's no color there at all. Yeah, no. There's no thinking, there's linear thinking, there's one color thinking. One color is monochromatic, monotonous, monotonous, is monotonous, yeah. and monotonous is boring, mm. which is why in board meetings, <gasps> yeah. <coughs> so the next big factor is thinking and mind maps. So when you're starting a company, you've got to have colors on the boardroom. You've got to have large sheets of unlined paper. Get yourself out of the prison. Yeah. You know those lines on paper, prison bars. Um, and you've then got to stay fit. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not fit, you haven't got the energy. Yeah. And the energy machine needs fuel. Mm. So you've got to have good food. You've got to have good exercise. You've got to get oxygen mm. in. Yeah. So you've got energy. And once you're on that, you then only need learning how to learn because you've got to learn how to learn. And in business, you've got to learn marketing. You've got to learn accounting. You've got to learn every aspect of it. You've got to learn communication. Uh, you therefore need to remember. You've got to learn how to remember what you've learned. You've got to learn how to mind map. Yeah. Because then it's all comfortable. And if you're starting that business, you can already be writing a book on the formation of this mm. company yeah. with mind maps. Right. So many things I'd love to jump into <laughs> here. So uh, <laughs> listening intently. <coughs> I, um, I would regard myself as a very creative person, um, but not really for any kudos on my part, just because I think I've not convinced myself I'm not. But some of the things you've said 
like if I'm not fed well and I'm not watered well and there's not enough sun, I am opposite of creative. I'm pretty grumpy. And, you know, if there's not enough air, so, I, you know, we're in your house here and obviously people can't see listening, but there's a, there's a whole wall of light here. There's animals chirping away in the back. You've got <laughs> fish and birds and everything else. So yes. you really, you've got nature, you've got environment, you've got light. Uh, and I find if you travel and go to places of nature and quieten your mind of all the chatter and distraction, then it's not like, often it's not that you need ideas to come in. You need to get rid of all the distractions and the noise to let ideas come out. What do you think about that? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Hence dark boardrooms, you know, with single colours and probably horrible heating or choky air con. Yes. Get outside, go and meet interesting people. Exactly. Yeah. We have to be, well, it's a nice yin yang on one level, the, the integrating of opposites. Because we have to be still and we have to move. Mm. And I have done surveys around the world asking people, where are you? Where are you when you are experiencing creative thinking? Where are you when you come up with good ideas? I'm normally in Costa Coffee, by the way. (laughs) So that that seems to work for me. (laughs) Or where are you when you suddenly remember things that you've forgotten? Mm. And the answer around the world is the same everywhere. In the bath. In nature. In the shower. In bed before I go to sleep. In bed when I'm asleep and I wake up with idea. Yeah. Or when I'm waking up. Oh ha ha. So the places where people are thinking creatively, even when they're on aeroplanes, long distance travelling, or long distance driving with your family, or long distance travelling in a train. In the beginning, people are did it, and then as the time goes on, and even when they're driving, even with the family there, everybody becomes quieter because they look around, because they're seeing things, mm. and then they can think. Mm. Thinking requires solitude and quiet. Mm. I.e. no technology, no phones, no dings, no dongs, no (laughs) kids, no dogs, no life, no staff, no... Exactly, exactly. The brain needs to have, if you like, the most important conversation, and that is with itself. Mm. And that is called thinking. Mm. You know, so the conversation with oneself is thinking. Yeah. And again, check all the top business people on the planet, all the great geniuses. What did they do? Into nature. On their own. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so when people start businesses, there is a tendency to think, well, you know, we've got to be on all the... Yeah, yeah, yeah we've got to be... Yeah, we've got to commu- communicate. Mm. We'll brainstorm, brainstorm, brainstorm. Yeah, we'll all be... Uh, with no deepness. Mm. <coughs> the common word is called mindfulness, yeah. which the <coughs> Asian tribes in China, Japan, Philippines, Cambodia, everywhere... They had the same philosophy. You know, one needs to be quiet. India, meditation. Japan, meditation. It doesn't mean you've got to be meditating all the day and just do nothing. It means you've got to give yourself time to integrate, Mm. to rest, and to communicate with the universe and with yourself. And when you've done that, Ta-da, let me tell you. Blah, 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 mm. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So we go through those phases mm. 
of real creativity mm. and real succeeding. And I guess then the 12 hour day work day and the seven day a week work ethic is almost the antithesis of that because people are work, 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 working, thinking that they're achieving, but they're blocking their ability to think. Would, would you agree with that? I would agree with that with even more passion than you said it with passion. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the common expression is TGF. TGF. And what do people say? Thank God it's Friday. So all the people in the organization say, yeah, TGF. <laughs> yeah, TGF. What does that mean? You know, they're all slapping each other on the back and da da da. And but think about it. Thank God it's Friday. So, by definition, we hated Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and most of Friday. Mm. But now we're happy because we're getting out of what we've been doing. Mm. We're escaping. We're going home where we can play, where we can enjoy, where we can go and eat, we can do things we want to do. Mm. We're not rigidified. Uh, and supplementing their philosophy is 24-7. 24-7. We're not going to have a 12-hour working day. We're going to work for 24 hours a day for seven days. I don't just disagree with that. It is insanity. It's the wrong sense of mad. Mm. It's destructive. It's self-destructive. It's relationship destructing. It's business destroying. Um, it's building up anger, frustration, hatred of what I'm going to have to do. Mm because I'm not enjoying myself at all. Mm. And so I agree with what you said. Mm. <laughs> and do you think you've managed to write 150 books as well because it's you're doing and expressing something you love to do and therefore you may not define it as work <coughs> in the usual 24-7 sense? Yeah, very good. Mm. I have said that my work... You know, I don't work from nine till five mm. or from eight till ten um, when I get up often the first thing I want to do is to get out yeah uh, go into nature mm. run row yeah no you got your row machine there yep <laughs> yeah you, did you so you did 5,000 meters before we got here I did is that right yeah Tod today yeah I went to the Marla rowing club right which is one of my favorite yeah Playgrounds. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and would, would it be remiss for me to ask how old you are? I think it may be relevant. I can give you um, three answers okay. to that. <laughs> yeah, I'm bracing myself. <laughs> you don't have to brace. Um, there are three ages that we have. Yeah. One is the age that people think you are. Yeah. Um, and the age that people think I am is anywhere from 50 to 95. Okay. Right. That's what people think. Yeah. Um, in some areas where people think, you know, he's got grey hair, must be over 80, um, or grey is very old. Mm. So immediately, boom, they see. So they see me like that. Yeah. There is the chronological diary age, you know, when was I born and what, where mm. am I now? Uh, that's number two. And then the third one is now the medical age, right. um, the body age. Mm. So when you take this lump of bones and flesh and water and manganese and mm. arsenic and calcium, <coughs> the machines now okay. analyze it and they say this lump is X number of years old. Mm. Um, and what its probable extension is going to be. Mm. So the age, my first one, they think I'm going to be between 50 and 95. Mm -hmm. And that is true. I'm somewhere there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel we're getting warmer. <laughs> <laughs> um, my chronological age, I was born in June 42. 
1942. Yep. So at this moment in chronological time, I am 74. Okay. My biological age, I am pleased to let you know, is that it's not even in that normal scale. Well. My biological age is 49. Wow. 49. And do you think the passion for what you do and allowing yourself to be free for expression is part of your low biological age? Without question. Mm -hmm. If I had been working and if I had been saying TGF, yeah. I You'd would be 470. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'd, I'd be very old. Yeah. And my life expectancy would be a lot lower, mm. a lot lower. Mm. You know, I would have developed kind of restful habits like getting drunk. Sure. Um, not looking after my body. Mm. I was, no, I'm too tired to go out there and yeah. run or go to the gym. No, I, I'll just, I won't do it today. I'll do it tomorrow. Mm. And then, of course, tomorrow I thought, well, I'm too tired anyway. Yeah. And I didn't like that. I'd better go home, get, go to the pub, have a mm. whatever. Uh, I would definitely not have been as biologically aged sure. as I am. Yeah. Okay, so the reason where I was sort of maybe leading with this was at your age, to me you still seem as passionate and as um, interesting and excited about your work as ever, whereas, you know, if you look at society, this is the retirement age and you're coming, <laughs> I'm, you know, we're meeting and you're giving me all these manuscripts. <laughs> this yeah. is one new book, so my map's the definition. The evolution of the human species, the evolution of human thought, and this is a um, 125. It's got to be more than that. It's a big. It is. And then there's the mind map, mindfulness. Yeah, but mindfulness. So you mind maps give you mindfulness. Right. So you're still churning out the work. I would. I would say not even that. Um, I would actually not say yes to that. I would say, as I have got chronologically older, I have become much more passionate mm. because the passion is now all directed. You know, if I see children around the world starving mentally, that is the most horrifying thing I can see. Mm. But I now know that much more than I knew when I was the old age of 50. Yeah. <laughs> now I know even more because I've seen more people. I know more about education. I now know more about the teacher. I know there are now more people th than there were when I was 50. Mm. There are now 7 billion. That's 2 billion more people. Yeah. And many of them are starving physically and mentally. And mental starvation is far more dangerous than just physical starvation. Because if you're physically starving and you don't know what to do, that's it. But if your brain is working, the last thing it focuses itself on is survival and learning how to think learning how to be creative is essential for real survival. Mm. So I now have another two billion human beings in my head who need good teaching, yeah. who need good education, who need how to think. So my passion is volcanic. Mm. Yeah. It's total. Mm. When I get up in the morning, <coughs> I don't listen to the news, you know, to the no news news. It's not news at all. You know, this is a day when one person killed that person in that country there, and this person in that political area thought that that person in that political area is stupid. But I think that that person who thinks that I'm thinking much better than that person thinks, and on they go. Yeah. And it's totally boring mm. and it's not true. Mm. 
so I am battling for the survival of human intelligence. Mm. Of so you have a cause. Do you think that fuels your energy, a, a, a I cause? I wouldn't even say it's a cause. It's a cause! <laughs> right? It's a cause. Yeah. It's huge. Mm. It's gigantic. Yeah. Does that give me any energy? <laughs> By definition. Mm. And that comes back to the daydream. Yeah. I mean, bringing it all down now to the business mm. community. When they wake up in the morning, they've got to have that vision. Yeah. That the, the dream is a vision. That is your passion. Mm. And the bigger it is, the more energy it gives you. Yeah. Because, you know, when you're fighting <coughs> for seven billion people mm. in your real internal universe, you got seven billion people and you're leading that army. That group, mm. that population. So when somebody says, um, "Well, you got thirty more years to live. Uh, would you like to spend a year of your life, you know, checking out the news and um, having a nice time and whatever?" And you got seven billion people who depend upon you. Mm. You say, "No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep fighting for them." Yeah. So what I want. And I will call you one of these. You are a warrior of the mind. Mm -hmm. That's what it's really about, isn't mm. it? I mean, everything you said, you are discussing the exploration of yourself mm -hmm. in order to energize and fuel and nurture your capacity and abilities to learn how to learn yeah. and to improve that. And I've read 500 books, I want to read another 50,000. And you want to do that. Why mm. do you want to do that? Because you then want to help other people do the same thing. Mm. That's a warrior of the mind. Yeah. Um, so that's a long answer to your question. Does your vision give you energy? Mm. Yes, it does! <laughs> 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 okay, Tony, look, I could sit here all day and talk to you and I'm loving this. I want to be respectful of your time. So how about we change direction a little bit and go to some shorter, quicker questions? Would you be Happy okay with that? that. Okay, so I know... Well, they can be longer questions, but um, the answers will be shorter. Okay, fine. <laughs> so we haven't talked yet about innovation. Uh, I understand you're very interested in innovation. So maybe you could define what you think innovation is. Yep, very easy. Creativity is the ability to generate ideas, to make associations, to you know, build structures. That's creativity. Innovation is doing precisely all of that, being creative, and saying, so, what am I going to do about that? Ah, I am going to put energy into making that idea that dream come true that is innovation right innovation is putting creativity into action great answer okay your business interests um do you mind just sort of sharing your business interests uh, in a few minutes i'm going to um, ask you where everyone can follow you and study you <coughs> um, because i think you're a very studyable person and um, i love it's studying it's studyable people <laughs> it's nice to be known as a Studyable person. It's nice to be known as a warrior of the mind. <laughs> so this is good. <laughs> We've exchanged good labels. Yes, we much have. better than the ADDH and yes. the dyslexic and the more. <laughs> yeah. <on. laughs> yeah. So yeah, maybe just uh, share actually, some of your. So more of you should go and share good labels mm. that are true mm. to people that help energizes them. Yes. And helps them reach their goals. Yes, and uh, just a quick little jump in there because. I mean, I've got kids who are nearly six and nearly three. And, you know, I think what you said about the mind and the atoms is great. It's like uh, kids at that age, you can see their brain is just always on overdrive. And something you say or do, they can immediately own. So if you tell them they're creative, they're good at drawing, they're great at imagination, they own it. 
and you see them come to life. And if you say, you can't do that, you mustn't do that, you're not good at that, you can see it do that to them. And, and I really believe one great thing you say to someone who's maybe lost faith in themselves that they could own that's good and true about them could change their life. And just by one labour you put on someone that's damaging to them could ruin their life. Absolutely true. One label can lazy you into nothingness mm. or into the universe. Yeah. So this podcast is called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. And I like to, <laughs> I like to interview disruptive people. And I, and I, and I think you're elegantly disruptive. Because uh, so, earlier you said, uh, was I a bit like Donald Trump? And he's maybe a bit more aggressively <laughs> disruptive. But I think you're elegantly and politely disruptive. You, you know, you've got this cause. That's a nice, a nice description again. Thank you. And thank you. So you've... I will, I will take that one. Okay, you could... You could uh, I don't want any patents on it. It's yours. <laughs> so what does the word disruptive mean to you? Uh, disruptive for me simply means when there is order of some sort that order is fractured, mm. broken. I love that answer. <laughs> uh, my, I think my staff would accuse me of doing that on a daily basis. <laughs> so their to-do list, I'd definitely disrupt them. Well, don't give them a to-do list. No. Give them now yeah. a my to-do map. my map. Right. And I mean, that's, that's both humorous, but yeah. it's serious. Of course. I myself, I once upon a time in my linear unintelligent age, you know, mm. I made lists of everything. Mm. And now, my maps. Mm. When I do a my map, it's like a little flower. Yeah. And, do, 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 and it grows. Mm. The list, it was always like other people, you know, write it, do it, cross it out. Yeah. So you end up with an ugly column of black X's. Mm. And it's thrown away. Yeah. I now end up with a lovely blossoming flower with lovely branches. And I've done all of this tick, mm. check, check, check. So this bloom mm. of everything I've done. Yeah. So in business, definitely make sure that everybody, and I mean everybody, learns how to mind map, how to apply it, mm. and how to take creativity to generate that first and then direct it into reality, mm. i.e. innovation. Yeah. And then they will survive. Right. Thank you. So part of me doing this podcast is kind of a, it's, a, it's an expression of my creativity. Uh, and so in meeting people like yourself, I love to get in the car and come and meet you personally or get in the plane and go and meet the CEO of Odomars Piguet or, you know, whoever I'm, I'm going to meet. And for me, that's part of the journey of doing it. And I love doing that. And so I like to ask, because I do travel a lot to do this, I don't want to come all this way and forget a really important question or there's something that Tony really wants to say to the world <laughs> that I haven't asked. Because I can't come, you know, I could come back, but I can't come back. <laughs> so is there anything I shouldn't have asked that, you know, you'd like me to ask or something you'd like to say? That's going to be another five hours. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we should do part two one day. My question was going to be, what about part two? Okay. So part two will be a good idea because mm -hmm. by the time we meet, the three books will be live. Will be live mm. and they'll be out there. Yeah. Um, one question you can ask me is, um, and these are entertaining questions. And you know, like titbits or like hors d'oeuvres. Um, what about business cards? Okay, I was coming to that because there is your business card that you gave to me. Yeah, I gave you mine. And you've got a, um, it's not an embossing, is it? Because you told Tom off for that. It's <laughs> a, um, it's a, an indent, is it? Yes. Okay, so it's you asked me to ask it's you it's about a letterpress this. imprint. Yes. Right. Because I don't carry cards, because I say, find me on my Facebook page or some of the social media things. So, what about business cards, Tony? Well, <coughs> the electronic world is non-tactile. And it's, it's not multi-sensory in the way that the world is. Mm. 
which is why when you watch young children, what do they want to do? They want to touch. If we're doing up our house, don't I know that? They want to touch everything that's wet yes. or not fixed or, or dangerous. <laughs> yeah. And let them touch it. Yeah, okay. Because then they will learn, because this thing is the most sophisticated machine in this machine. Mm. The hand. The hand is like a giant cable and it siphons up mm. all the information smack into the brain and it registers this is one of those yeah and now I need I to go back and get mine done I can actually You've convinced me yeah, <laughs> I can touch this yeah and when I watch people exchanging themselves you know and they they say um Oh yeah, I'll I'll just um uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, go on, tell me. Yeah. Yep. Thanks a lot. Put it in, and that's it. Mm. <laughs> all the senses gone. Yeah. All the contact gone. In Asia, when they give you a card, it's given with both hands. Right. Why? Because then they have to face each other. Mm. So you can actually do the terrifying thing of looking somebody eye to eye instead of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's my card. Yeah. And people say, oh yeah, thanks. Yeah. And they don't even look at it. Mm. And I've tested people, you know, social gatherings, cocktail parties, and they're given cards and they've got six cards. Mm. And it's, you know, meeting the first seven people. And you say, tell me the seven people you just met. Um, oh, um, well, hold on a minute. I said, no, not they're not in the pocket. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So this, as the Asians believe and I believe them, it's an, ex it's an expression of your soul. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to Vista print then. I'm going to get a good quality one. Well, it depends what you want. To I, want I want a good one now. I want a thick one with sharp edges. It doesn't have to be cutting sharp. No, okay, I don't <laughs> want to hurt people. I'm just, I'm just daydreaming about my business card, Tony. Indeed, <laughs> and you are, I know you're going to innovate. Yeah. Because what's going to be on it? Mm. You know, because sometimes when you give it to someone, that may be the last time they ever see you. Mm. And I, I think you're right, it's an expression of who you are. Yes. And, um, and I'd I, like to I have a collection of cards from the people who yeah. I meet. You're not in my collection because yeah. you don't have one. Now I'm feeling like an outsider now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge, Tony, you, um, when we were here, you said, you, you know, what's the appropriate attire? Thank you. And thank you very much. Yes. And you decided to wear a suit. And uh, you asked for a theme or a colour. And I said, well, the disruptive entrepreneur kind of colour brand is purple. And you've got your purple tie on and there's a purple lining in your suit. And I just there wanted is. to um, thank you for that. That's very nice of you to do. No one's ever done that before who's been interviewed. They've dressed for the colour of the brand. Really? Yeah. So thank you. Well, I'm delighted that you are delighted. Okay. Now, I'm, I mustn't go without talking about your books because I'm a fan. You know, I read your books when I was starting in business. So 05, 06, you know, when I was in my bedroom, in my business, lonely, didn't really know what to do or where to go. And, you know, your books really helped me, uh, certainly with things like culturing, cultivating the idea, and um, certainly all the memory stuff that I've learned from you has really helped. So um, I asked you to pick out, you've got 150, so we can't um, promote them all, but um, you picked out this one, Mind Maps for Business, being yes, entrepreneurs well, that follow the, dis the yes. disruptive entrepreneur, and BBC are your publisher as well, that's very credible. Um, so, hey look, I, I assume it's on Amazon, is it? It is. So, okay, great. So that's um, one for business people. Your one that's coming out next is The Teacher. 2nd of June. Okay. And, and could you give us a sort of a 15, 20 second summary of the concept of the book? Mm -hmm. The teacher is in the most important profession in the world. The teacher needs to be labelled as a human being doing the most important thing in the world teaching mm. and the book defines what a teacher really is mm -hmm. and has 36 
definitions of what a teacher is. Right. And the book is illustrated. It has images and stories from the best teachers in the history of the world as okay. we know. And it's just saying, whoever you want to be, make sure you want to be a teacher anyway. Mm. And if you're going to be a parent, if you're a parent, are you a teacher? All the surveys say yeah. most parents are not teachers. Yeah. Are you? <laughs> well, that is the biggest load of rubbish I've ever heard. Exactly. I and mean, therefore, yeah. that, that, yeah. that book is for every parent, yeah. not just to go into a school with a blackboard mm. or a whiteboard and in a row bunch of desks. Yeah. It's to teach how to teach. Right. Okay. So I will definitely be getting that book. Um, yep. I, and also, I, I really believe that you know, the mark you make on the planet is the information, the inspiration, the education you give to other people. It's your legacy. When you're gone, that's what's left. Yes. And that is teaching. Yes. So, um, yeah, you've, you've, um, you've riled me up, Tony, because I, I do feel that the teaching profession is underrated and underskilled, generally, because we all remember for life our best teachers. Yes. And also our worst teachers can really hold us back. So, yes. Um, yeah, you've... Um, yeah, you've, you've inspired me. Thank you. <laughs> and then good. finally, where can people follow you? Do you... Do you um, you, you can know? follow me. Yeah. <coughs> well, first of all, I'm traveling and I'm going to be this year going to the Gulf. Okay. To uh, Egypt, to El Sudan. Mm. I didn't mean stalk you, like follow you around the you globe know, no. behind <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> but I was... Because I'm going to China a lot, to okay. Asia yeah. a lot, Australia, around the world. Mm. In fact, the tie that I'm wearing yeah. is Chinese because mm. I was going to say, you know, happy Chinese New Year time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so I will be followable because yeah. in China, there's going to be the World Memory Championships. Right. This time, yeah. this year. Um, and the Memory Championships, again, a main passion of mine. Yeah, maybe we should do that in the part two because we didn't talk about memory techniques. Maybe that should we be would our part would love two. to do memory in part two yeah. because memory vital. Yeah. So people can follow me uh, on Twitter. Yeah. Tony underscore yeah. Buzan. Yeah, got that there. Great. And I love Twitter. And okay. if, if anybody wants to tweet and tweet something worth passing on, I retweet it. Okay. One of my com commitments. Okay. Uh, you can get me on my web. Yeah. TonyBuzan.com. Very right. complex. <laughs> TonyBuzan.com. Yeah. Uh, ThinkBuzan. ThinkBuzan.com is the MindMap, iMindMap software yep. available. Okay. And training to become a MindMap trainer as well. Yeah. Um, and you can contact me through Rob. Okay. <laughs> This Rob. <laughs> <laughs> so you can contact me through Rob. <laughs> right. Tony, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for, you, uh, for inviting me, us into your home uh, and being so welcoming. And um, I'm, with your permission, going to take you up on the part two and maybe we'll focus on the memory techniques. I will remember that. Thank you. Look forward. Highly enjoyable. And thank, thank you, you for being so immaculately punctual. Thank you. You're to the second. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Highly intelligent. Thank you. <laughs>